Ms. Louise Allen, I'm the Education Awareness Manager of the Class Council of Ireland. Um, and before I introduce Dr. Robert Mills, I just want to um, talk a little bit about the Class Council of Ireland, what our role is, and how we came to be involved um, in the Interchange Symposium and the process that, that has led to the symposium. The Crafts Council of Ireland is the national organisation for the creative and economic development of the craft industry in Ireland. Um, we're funded by the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment through Enterprise Ireland. And we're committed to nurturing and developing the next generation of makers and to highlighting the importance and relevance of Irish craft both to our heritage and to our contemporary visual culture. In the context of the Interchange Symposium, um, it's an important event that provides the opportunity for the audience here and hopefully audiences in the future to engage in meaningful and stimulating conversations about craft. The process which led to this symposium taking place was initiated and inspired by Caroline Madden, um, who many of you know, uh, who I think had a conversation uh, in, in America with Mary Banyard White about coming to Ireland. Um, but Caroline has an incredible passion for craft and she also has a drive and an ability to see and make time for connections. So for the Crafts Council of Ireland, when <coughs> she approached us with a proposal to develop a lecture series which would assist craft people, craft people to develop their critical and analytical skills, to enrich their knowledge of art, craft and design theory, and to provide a space for a diverse range of makers at different stages of their study and career to engage with each other, we thought that that was extremely important. Um, as an organisation, we're very much aware of the need to develop suitable plat platforms where critical discussion and debate about craft can take place. And to this end, in 2009, there were a number of initiatives. The Cross Council launched the Critical Writing uh, in Irish Craft Award, and that was in partnership with the Irish Arts Review. And we also welcomed the opportunity to engage in this partnership with NCAD and the Fulbright Commission. Uh, the partnership, as we know, has facilitated and supported the landscape of aesthetics and design, which is the lecture series, which commenced in October of last year. And it has led to this interchange of symposium and exhibitions. Over the course of the past few months, um, I've had the opportunity to attend some of the lectures and some of the group discussions that have taken, that have taken place so I'm very well aware of the level of commitment and effort that was required from both the facilitators and the participants. I'd like to congratulate them all because I think that the programme looks extremely dynamic and I believe that it will be a very engaging two days of discussions in relation to craft. As you'll note, there are a number of themes that run through the symposium and I believe those themes were selected by the participants themselves and they reflect the concerns and the challenges um, that face the craft industry in Ireland and across the world today. Um, and I do believe, just listening to some of the um, ideas that came up in Glenn's presentation, that we do require a mindset shift. And I think that the econ economic situation in Ireland is actually something that could uh, have very, very positive outcomes in relation to that, in relation to how we value um, craft, for one thing, but also what we value and why we value it. Um, I believe that our next speaker, Dr. Robert Mills, is going to talk about some of the challenges uh, that face craft, crafts in the USA. He'll be talking about some of the initiatives that help to sustain the craft industry. Uh, Dr. Robert Mills was invited because he is a practicing sculptor and ceramicist himself, uh, but he also holds um, a number of academic posts in art and design at uh, colleges across America. He has a PhD in Higher Education Administration, he has an MFA in Ceramics, a BA in Philosophy and Fine Arts. His artworks have been included in over 165 exhibitions and he has had 26 one or two person shows. He is currently President of the National Association of Schools of Art and Design in the USA and is Professor of Art and Dean of the College of Visual Arts and Design at the University of North Texas. Uh, his works are represented in private and public collections uh, in the Renwick Gallery, the Smithsonian Institute, the Arizona State University, the San Jose Museum of Art and the Erie Museum, as well as numerous private, private collections. Uh, Dr. Robert Milnes was invited by our full bright scholar Mary Banger Dwight and I'd like you to put your hands together for to welcome. 
Greetings. First, uh, let me say how happy I am to be with you today. Coming here uh, has given me the opportunity to explore and think about a subject sort of near and dear to my heart in daily life, and to visit a country I've always wanted to see, and to meet and see again some people whose uh, works I've read uh, and seen and admired for many years. So I'm going to concentrate today on three basic topics, exploring them largely from an institutional perspective, and focusing primarily on higher education and what follows, uh, whether degree-based or more focused or more suited professional practice. The first topic will concern the models and goals for teaching crafts in higher education, which, in, which have evolved over the past two centuries as the institutions in which they are taught and the broader cultural communities in which they take place have changed. The term craft is becoming increasingly rare in a university or arts, uh, art school setting today. Most recently, the study of ceramics, metals, textiles, glass, and wood, the fields most often, uh, most often associated with the term crafts, have been identified as material studies programs or parts of three-dimensional design studies, focusing the curriculum on the matter of which these things are made or through which ideas may be explored rather than the processes or outcomes specific to individual career fields. Technical focus has lost apparent ground to conceptual development in both art and design. This can be seen as troubling, enabling, or both. A second topic would, uh, will be what I will refer to as return to sustainability in fields. I call it a return because it reflects a renewed awareness of the scarce resources and fragile economies that really have always surrounded professional practices in these fields. Many people in schools simply sidestep the impact of the economies and, ec and economic forces around the use of materials and time that have always shaped these practices when institutions basically pick up the bills. Sustainability has also taken on a new meaning in terms of skills, marketing, production and studio practices in light of a new focus on critical dialogue about the work itself. Sustainability then in studio practices refers both to the wide use of shepherding of resources and the ability to maintain a vital and intellectual challenging practice over time, sustaining the craft or studio practice and the studio craft's person themselves. A third will be the economic impact of the craft industry, a different side of the impact of economies on the craft industry, which combines elements of earlier and contemporary philosophy, uh, DIY philosophy or necessity, and changing markets, and is in a number of regions an important aspect of the new creative economy thinking. All of these are or should be important parts of the curriculum and community development as issues that bring people to the craft. After talking about their history, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, these concepts through examples of innovative programs offered in higher education institutions, art centers, networks, blog sites, research centers, philanthropic and government institutions that challenge and sustain craft thinking and production. Several studio practices that have been sus uh, sustained for decades by individuals or groups uh, that address these issues in different ways will be featured. And I, and I found in preparing for the talk, I concentrated most heavily on ceramics programs, uh, studios, probably because that's the field in which I've worked for almost 40 years and uh, the people in, with whom I'm most familiar. In schools, we are always teaching somewhere in a spectrum that consists of cherishing and being intrigued by what has happened in the past and questing to understand and do the important next thing. That's our job. We investigate, we invent, uphold process and content, context and priorities, vocabularies and expertise. We are there to, want to impart knowledge, wonder and skepticism and to help prepare people with need and interest for the world to come and to understand how and why we do what we do now. Uh, a brief history of the development of these types of schools should help. Much of what we do in the United States today developed in the 19th century in what was at first uh, an agrarian economy and by the end of the century, largely an industrial one. Uh, 
Much of what we do now in the United States developed in the 19th century in what was at first an agrarian economy. Much of it has come to the United States from England or from other countries, uh, other <coughs> European countries. So some of these things, the issues that I'll be talking about today, let me go through a couple of these to catch up. Uh, we'll be talking about higher education, community workshops and residencies, sustainable practices, research and advocacy. Our earliest models um, are really from the Royal Academy of Art in England, which was founded in 1868 through royal patronage, and focused on teaching studio practice through the Continental Atelier model, which grew out of the apprenticeship tradition. The second uh, really model or base was the School of Design, founded by the Parliament in 1837 to train designers, craftsmen, and artists for industry, a school model that borrowed heavily from a German model of classes and lessons. So this is a focus, a different focus in purpose, sponsorship, and, par and, and desire and goals. The first university art classes taught in the United States were actually at West Point Academy, our military academy, where in 1803, John Trumbull, an artist and revolutionary war officer who studied at the Royal Academy, taught drawing to future officers. The purpose of it, really, was a practical one, to help them develop battle plans. Trumbull, schooled in the fine arts, went on to establish the first uh, art program at a U.S. university at Yale University. Yale University then went on to form the first formal school of art in 1869. The industrial model comes to us through a more structured applied arts curriculum and could be seen in the first classes taught at the Philadelphia School of Design for Women, established in 1848 and now the Moore College of Art and Design, still the only college of art and design in the country for women. The original program at Moore was to, pre was to prepare women for careers in art, and the first curriculum was in textile design, due to the importance of the textile industry in Philadelphia. The importance of textile design and teaching of art re uh, related to careers in industry was next shown in the passage of the Massachusetts Free Drawing Act of 1870, which for the first time required the teaching of a studio art course, drawing, in the public schools. Free drawing had two meanings. One, it was for the public schools and therefore was to be offered for free, uh, free of cost. But it's also specifically not pattern-based drawing, which was part of a much more industrial curriculum. This career focus is a compelling feature in higher education funding, particularly in the public schools, where art is taught first and foremost for economic development and secondarily for cultural enrichment. Like all things that are tax-based, you ultimately need to show how the tax base will benefit by the expense. In the 1860s, prominent Boston citizens, successful in the China trade, textile manufacturing, railroads, and retailing, successfully petitioned the legislature to form the Massachusetts Institute of Technology first, the Museum of Fine Arts next, and in 1873, the Massachusetts State's Normal School. This school was based on the School of Design model from England and a curriculum from Germany brought to the United States through Canada by Walter Smith, the first director of the school. It became a model for other normal schools, programs in art and design. Now the Massachusetts College of Art and Design, it remains the only public art and design college in the country. The great majority of the public college or university programs then grew up in relation to art education or to the industrial arts and design. The school of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts uh, affiliated with the museum formed in 1870 also still exists today, though a great majority of its sister schools have now separated from their parent museums in the same way that many university pro uh, museums are quite separate from the studio art programs. Along with what I would call formal or degree-based higher education, arts and crafts education also comes to higher ed through programs like the Grange, where agrarian groups banded together for political, civic, and educational purposes um, or other craft or uh, career-focused programs such as Lucy Morgan's founding of the Penland School. <coughs> By the late 19th century then, the, prep, the pattern was largely set. There were four basic types of universities and colleges, all of which may be publicly or privately owned, 
proprietary or not-for-profit institutions. Liberal arts colleges predominate. These are comprehensive, largely undergraduate, and often religiously affiliated. Teachers' colleges are the next largest group of four-year schools. They were the former normal schools, mostly public, comprehensive, or master's grant. Research <coughs> universities are more rare. They're primarily public and doctoral granting institutions. There are also technical or specialized colleges, like the independent art schools, for example, or polytechnics. And more recently, our most common form, community colleges, two-year schools that are focused on either or both college preparation or vocational programming. Programmings in these and other schools may or may not lead to degrees because professional certificates, which are not as structured and are much more flexible, are always available. The crafts that predominantly innovate, um, The crafts have predominantly entered higher education through the teachers' colleges where they were related to primary and secondary education and through the agricultural and land grant colleges where they were related to local industries and private art schools and universities where they were often related to local industries, art historical studies, and specific museum collections. They are never isolated, though, from their other disciplines in the institutions in which they're taught, and they're never static in content or placement. One of my very great interest is where the crafts are located, where art studies are located, because it shapes the dialogue around them. You know, it shapes the values, it shapes the words that are used, and it shapes, in some cases, the practices. For example, among the programs being discussed today, the California College of the Arts, founded in 1907, and formerly the California College of Arts and Crafts, was founded as part of the arts and crafts movement in the United States, fusing the arts in practical-based studies linked with architecture. The University of Wisconsin's art department first arose first from the engineering department in the College of Arts and Sciences as a manual labor curriculum, later assimilating parts of the College of Education well, the uh, University of Florida's fine arts curriculum was first born in an architecture school. The College of Visual Arts and Design program at the University of North Texas, where I am, is one that grew, grew up primarily through art education, assimilating programs from the industrial arts and home economics as those were phased out at the university. And all are now housed in colleges, schools, or departments of fine arts. There has been a rapprochement among these uh, formerly alienated fields today. Most programs, I was, uh, I was once in a school where three programs had merged together to form an institution. They asked me if that was unusual, and I said in my experience, most of them have formed the other way, you know, by things breaking apart. Uh, but there's a rapprochement now in these formerly alienated fields through a focus on sustainable practices, ecological concerns, and a sometimes sardonic and hip uh, DIY philosophy, which means you borrow from different areas as soon as you need it. The integration of materials into design processes is in, and of course new approaches to critical theories in the field. The crafts or material studies uh, fields thrive in innovative centers in those institutions and in schools where faculty interest in student development have created strong networks in notable directions. So I'll talk about a group of schools today um, starting with schools that focus in things that might be, uh, in some of their programs, more um, traditional craft oriented, and then going on into things where they have branched out and merged uh, with other disciplines as well. The University of Florida is a research institution where ceramics is the only uh, traditional crafts discipline in a studio arts program. The crafts program is headed by Linda Arbuckle, who focuses heavily but not exclusively on vessel production and sustainable studio practice. Linda's comments uh, were uh, used at the beginning of this talk, and we'll come back to uh, talk a little bit about what her graduate students are doing today. In these presentations and in this discussion about school, one of the things I want to do is focus on people because I think well, the, the, uh, my interest here and my sort of approach is institutional all of this eventually comes down to a handful of people who are doing things individually because they're the ones 
who has the role of imparting those knowledge, creating the curriculum, and moving it forward. So really, despite the structural uh, nature of all of this, you really come back down to a small group of folks. The University of North Carolina at Asheville is quite a different school. It's a regional campus of the University of Ash uh, North Carolina system. Very small program, several thousand versus 20, 30, 40,000 students an art program that really has six or seven faculty versus 40, 50, or, or more. Um, but the focus at the University of North Carolina in Asheville is the development of a crafts campus because of the economic structure of the region. So they're very interested in, in uh, developing a new and innovative program that's based on sustainable energy systems, lifestyles, and project development in the curriculum itself as well as the construction of the overall campus. Brent Skidmore, a wood furniture designer, is the director of that campus. The University of North Texas at Denton is a much different sort of institution. It has a strong, as I said, art educational base. Um, and our programs in ceramics, uh, metals, and fibers, particularly in uh, ceramics and uh, metals, have a very, um, I would say, utilitarian and studio pottery base. Our graduates tend to go out as people who um, operate and, uh, and, and run individual studios. Uh, they also tend to go out from the graduate program as people who teach, often in community colleges or other areas throughout the Midwest. So, Jerry Austin and Elmer Taylor are the ceramics faculty. Elmer Taylor is a, a Michael Cardew student. So he brings the English pottery tradition of Bernard Leach and others to that. Harlan Butt, uh, the jeweler at the program, Harlan is an analyst whose work is based on um, uh, really exploration of the national park systems and the flora and fauna of the United States. He and Anna uh, works in for, uh, fabricated for, uh, forged metals. Um, she's also a scholar in the field, having just written a history of metalsmithing in the United States. But their programming students tend to come out in individual studio practices. The University of Washington is quite a different place. It's where I went to school and um, uh, for graduate school. And Jamie Walker, um, uh, 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 let's see, Akio Takamura and others are now in the ceramics program there. At the University of Washington, um, some of their crafts programs dwindled. The history of higher education is also a circumstantial one, and it depends on who's in what position at what point in time. Um, if you have uh, strong faculty and, and positions of economic retrenchment, it's uh, harder to keep the, you know, the programs tend to stay. If your chief faculty tend to resign about the time uh, budgets disappear, the programs do too. So um, always put your people where they need to be at the time they need to be there if you can arrange it. Uh, the metals program, for instance, uh, long, uh, long a strong one in Seattle, was just gone. Uh, and it had to do with retirements and economies at the moment. Ceramics program is in a separate facility and it's merged into what is called a 3D 4M program, originally three dimensional four materials, um, that deliberately links now ceramics, glass, and sculpture in a conceptually based multidisciplinary focus. That is, students take classes in all of those and come back together for cross-disciplinary studies at the undergraduate level. At the graduate level, of course, it's a little more open as to what people do. Jamie Walker is the chair of the program and teaches ceramics there. Uh, Mark Zirkel, who is from Virginia Commonwealth University that I'll talk about later, is the head of the glass program is the glass program. Um, the glass program at the University of Washington is not taught on campus. It's taught in a separate facility. Um, the ceramics and sculpture facilities um, are, as they were when I went to school, almost a mile from the rest of the art department. And um, you tended not to meet the rest of those folks till it was time to do the graduate show and say, oh, uh, time to do a gallery. Um, the University of Wisconsin at Madison has a fascinating history reflective of, land grant, uh, of its land grant roots in a populous state. Um, the university started out with uh, programs in art education and with industrial arts programs. 
these were sort of merged as the programs went along. They have some engineering bases and things to, uh, to their background. Kim Kreider and Lisa Gralnick teach metals, reflecting utility as a conceptual and sculptural um, takeoff point, really. Tom Lozier chairs the department, the expansive 3D and 4D program, which links ceramics, digital modeling, glass and neon, jewelry and metalsmithing, sculpture, video and performance, and woodworking furniture. Students at the undergraduate curriculum take courses across those areas and then choose in one way or another a sort of focus within them. Virginia Commonwealth University at Richmond is considered uh, by many people the strongest public art uh, uh, university program in the country. Uh, the Crafts and Materials Studies Department is newly chaired by Sonia Clark and offers metal, fibers, wood, glass, and clay studios which, um, and also offers, I would say in the, in the research I did for this presentation, one of the most consistent professional practice exposures for graduate and undergraduate students I've heard of, which may help explain the success of some of their graduates. The program, um, the program is one that, uh, that tends to link these through both interdisciplinary studies and through um, and through basically foundation courses. If you go to their website, you'll see a really interesting picture that's both a concept and a nice image where there's a hand and the, uh, the materials for the craft series are written on each of the fingers. And so it's like materials and crafts as a linked area, again, coming back through hand skills, but thought of as a very conceptual approach to how those things happen. Uh, this particular piece of hers I like very much is combs. Um, it has to do with uh, the products that are produced commercially and then used by different cultures and the ones that are produced that work for some cultures and others, depending on the nature of your hair. Combs are different. And so uh, Sonia Clark's work uses that. She also works very extensively with people. Um, she had come from Michigan. She had worked in Detroit and other areas uh, with people on projects that link cultural heritages with group endeavors for uh, people of all ages. Uh, this project actually has taken place all over the world, the Beaded Prayer Project. California College of the Arts, formerly California College of Arts and Crafts, is a really interesting institution, both in terms of its history and uh, its location. It has two campuses now. One of them is historic campus in Oakland, California, and its new campus in San Francisco, which are on opposite sides of the San Francisco Bay Bridge and depending on traffic, um, either close or not. But, uh, and the two are basically different studies areas. The design programs are taught mostly in the uh, San Francisco campus, the fine arts and crafts in the traditional home in Oakland. Um, this program has uh, courses that are taught in ceramics, in glass, in furniture, in jewelry, metals, in textiles. Um, it's a tremendously integrated program. Nathan Lynch is, the is one of the ceramics instructors, along with Arthur Gonzalez and others. Students may major in individual disciplines, but all of them are required to take 2D, 3D, and 4D courses as well as interdisciplinary courses, and one that I found really unusual um, in an art school curriculum, which was a diversity-based class. And in part, the diversity-based class is to um, satisfy a general education requirement in higher education, which deals with cultural uh, knowledge and things. But this is a studio-based one that brings students together to look specifically at issues of race, class, sexual identity, and others in an interdisciplinary format and project-based one. Um, in their ceramic area, for instance, um, Nathan Lynch's students will be involved in creating bird habitats for uh, wildlife refuge areas. They will work with architecture programs, uh, architectural offices on internships. So they're related across a variety of disciplines along with some traditional studio crafts areas. Allison Smith, the new head of the department that includes all these areas, is a sculptor whose practice 
really is based on um, a sort of cultural performance within traditional craft media. So she will uh, create, use, or have fabricated things that come out of uh, crafts traditions from a variety of countries, but then she will add <coughs> to those a street performance that tends to harken back to political activities of the 60s and another decade. So along with formal colleges and universities, there are other ways that people uh, move on in the crafts. In the United States today, there are 3,300 to 3,400 higher education institutions. And I mentioned most of these are uh, predominantly either private liberal arts colleges. Uh, there are about 1,200 of those. Community colleges, there are about 15 or 1,600 of those. Uh, the formal normal schools like UNT and others, there are 300 of those. And then the research universities, there are about 100 of those. All of these are accredited through uh, programs like regional accrediting agencies, um, national accrediting agencies, and most of the ones I've talked about today, and about 270 others, are accredited through an organization called the National Association of Schools of Art and Design, of which I happen to be the president. Um, that group tends to work with its member institutions to talk about curricular structures, talk about competencies and outcomes that are expected in the field, and from those discussions, you get a sort of ongoing basis for the slow evolution of university curricula. Uh, for instance, uh, the NASA handbook states for a student with a degree in general crafts or studio art, uh, the competencies students should come out with are things like understanding of basic design principles, concept, media, and format, knowledge and skills of the use of craft techniques, the ability to solve design and basic technical problems in one or more area, a working knowledge of various design methods and their relationships to conceptualization, development, and completion of projects, an understanding of the similarity, differences, and relationships among the fields, and finally, an understanding of, cra of crafts, of the place of crafts in the history of art and design. They should have a functional knowledge of business practices as well in specific craft fields or so on, like for instance in a major in ceramics, you uh, tie that down to more specific knowledge about handling the materials, working in the area, and then more specific work toward a uh, final project. So all of these courses, all of the programs meet issues and they're under great discussion now. Um, I would say there's more foment around the curriculum right now than I've probably seen in 20 or 30 years. Um, now, for instance, the issues though, uh, if you look at books like Propositions of the, uh, well, the Art School, Propositions for the 21st Century, by, um, edited by Stephen uh, Madoff, you'll look at all sorts of new ways of looking at art schools that are not based on either the Bauhaus or agrarian traditions that we have, or even the social responsibility traditions that come out of the early 20th century. They tend to reflect more of the market forces and changing philosophies about authors, ob uh, authorship objects, and making art, some of which you've heard about in our first talk today. I caution, however, in discussing most curriculums that one of the things that I found consistent about most artists that I know is at least when they speak of themselves, they think of themselves as largely self-taught wherever they found their materials, uh, whether they came out of an art school or, a, or an individual basis. It tends to be uh, to discussed in terms of learning to forget what you learned when you got there. Uh, not impossible. So community workshops and residencies are other ways that people learn about the arts and other ways that people make a transition to professional uh, careers through the arts. We had a wonderful artist speaking at uh, UNT uh, just last week, Teresita Fernandez, who's a sculptor, whose inspiration works reflect a clear sense of what I would call crafts, techniques, materialities, processes, and visual sensibilities. But she said the most important thing for, an, uh, for a new graduate of an art program, and I'd say this to uh, anybody here too, was to think their work was important and find a way to keep doing it um, after you get out of school. She thinks of residencies um, as a critical way to do that. And so I want to talk about three places that provide those residencies as well as workshops and classes. 
The Penland School of Crafts is the first of these. Penland is an idyllic setting. Um, I've been there three times. Each time it has been at a pivotal, changing point in my life. And I think that's what studies like this are all about. They're really places where you go and reflect, as well as where you go to actually learn a specific technique. Penland was started in 1928 by Lucy Morgan. Um, it's run on the basis of residencies for artists that last from uh, well, one to three years. They have short-term residencies of up to three months. They teach classes in the summer that people from all over the world come to take in materials, everything from handmade books to uh, glass blowing, wood furniture, and so forth. Um, there are scholarships and work-study programs for people. It's located in the hills of North Carolina, um, which has long had a craft tradition and a strong development of that area as part of the economic engine, really, of western North Carolina and eastern Tennessee. The residency program brings people in. They have uh, studios, there are galleries, there are sales forces. Um, it's a collective endeavor where people eat together or not, depending on their, on their choices, but there is a common dining hall and things. So it's very much a residency setting. Pottery Northwest is a different sort of structure um, with the same sort of purpose, but in an urban setting. Pottery Northwest is in Seattle, Washington. You can see um, the sort of iconic space needle looming over the top of the building in the lower picture. Um, it was uh, first put together in the 1960s by the Seattle Clay Club. And like a lot of movements in the 60s and 70s, it was a collective, really where uh, people sharing common interests or common purposes could come together to share equipment, studio facilities that you couldn't build on your own. So it was a sort of rental pay-as-you-go model. Um, at Pottery Northwest, artists will pay $100 a month to be a resident there. There are up to 10 residences, resident artists. Uh, they will be there for up to three years. They pay for their material and firing costs. They may work at the, uh, I think each of the residents are expected to work for a couple of hours a week and may also teach. Um, they also teach classes and they have large sales galleries. They are underwritten in part by the city of Seattle, but about 70% of their economic model is um, self-generated funding. So the money that keeps it operating come from the classes, the pay for the materials, the pay for the utilities, and so forth. And then that smidgen of the $100 a month, if you think about that, 10 artist residents then are paying $1,000 a month, which isn't going a long way toward rent or anything else. But um, So it's largely the classes, the sales, and the, um, and the city support, and some small part of philanthropy that underwrites it. But the artists there work in a variety of ways in clay. Um, a lot of utilitarian work, a lot of individual studio practice, some performance gets in, uh, integrated with this. So it's really an artistic residence program focused on a single material. The Pittsburgh Glass Center is the third of these I'd like to talk about. And this is a really fascinating study. Um, in the 1980s, Carnegie Mellon University changed its curriculum radically and eliminated all of the crafts from the art school. Uh, ceramics, glass, metals, others were just uh, taken out. So um, many of the faculty that were left went on to do other things. And uh, Kathleen Mulcahy, uh, who was the glass teacher at the time, and Ron Desmond, her partner, who had been a student in ceramics at Carnegie Mellon, uh, went together and decided to form a glass center that would allow the teaching of glass and build on the Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh's industry in glass. Pittsburgh gla uh, Plate Glass is a huge company in Pittsburgh, and there's been a long tradition of use of it. Pittsburgh is an area of the country that uh, is rich in the natural materials that, of course, made it a steel industry. Coal and others are there, water for the production facilities, but also tremendous clay deposits and things in the area. So it's a very good area for making glass, and all the uh, glass or clay always has been. Um, they worked with, the, uh, with foundations in the Pittsburgh area, the Heinz Foundation, the Pittsburgh Foundation. Pittsburgh is rich 
in a philanthropic tradition that came out of the steel industry at the turn of the century, which has also had a sort of a, a social, well, the sort of social give back notion that Carnegie and others came up with, uh, that have helped sponsor a lot of change in the Pittsburgh community. It's a city that has gone through economic cycles of heights and depths unparalleled in most, in most areas. Um, Mulcahy and Desmond were able to put together the funding and background support to take over an old, uh, an old actually car dealership in uh, Pittsburgh and build what became a world-class uh, glass center. However, the current economic slump has destroyed their economic model, which is largely built more on philanthropy than um, that endowments could sustain in the slump that happened recently. And so several years ago, it was taken over and given over to a really fascinating person named Charlie Humphreys to run. Charlie Humphreys um, now runs three units in Pittsburgh. One is the Pittsburgh Glass Center, the other is Pittsburgh Filmmakers, and now the Pittsburgh Glass Center, uh, and, and also the Pittsburgh Center for the Arts. All of which were nonprofit collaborative centers that came on economic hard times, and all of which were given over to Charlie Humphreys to run. <laughs> by the foundations and city organizations that have supported them. Um, the goal there is to build an earned income model that will get it more towards self-sufficiency, though of course it recognizes that a large part of this is always going to require underwriting from city agencies and private groups. Pittsburgh Glass Center brings in artists from throughout the world to create pieces working with uh, skilled craftspeople and artists at the site, or perhaps being art glass artists themselves. It teaches community workshops for all ages. It has a huge educational program, a very wonderful gallery, and then world-class glass facilities. So the center, like, uh, like Pottery Northwest and like, um, and like Penland, also offers residencies to artists as well as, um, in this case, like pottery uh, in a sort of more individual market based on glass, it also offers hourly charges for use of the facilities. So somebody can come in and rent the glass furnaces for a certain period of time. I want to talk about three people who have also sustained studio practices through a variety of economics and cultural shifts in the, uh, in the crafts and arts market. And the first of these is a man named John Fullwood, whose Kissinee River Pottery in Frenchtown, New Jersey, um, is really a one-person studio operation. John has been doing this since about 1981. He's a studio potter trained at the University of North Texas. Um, he's first started his career by um, selling at Renaissance fairs, fairs that recreate a Renaissance period environment around the United States. These are they, take, they take place still all over the country, though not as many of them. And John would go around ahead of the fair, and he had studios in different places. He was like an itinerant potter and would go and uh, make pieces, sell them at the fair, and move on to the next one. Uh, that got old as his family grew, and uh, you know, they needed a little more stability. They lived first in Florida and then moved to Frenchtown, New Jersey. Um, John bought about a 4,000 square foot building and now runs uh, the pottery, but rents out some space to other artists and then also teaches classes. The current economic slump have made the teaching of classes a much more important part of his operation than it used to be. Um, when, uh, uh, just listening to Glenn's talk on replication, the full wood measure is uh, a tool that John produces <laughs> for replicating pottery forms that he sells also as a device uh, to other potters so that they can use it as a measuring device in, uh, in creating, again, individual pieces but replicating the shapes and uh, measurements of other pieces. A pit fire workshops and other community activities helped with, with this economic model. Bill Campbell was my neighbor when I lived in Cambridge Springs, Pennsylvania. Uh, Bill was from Flint, Michigan. He had uh, studied in the area and uh, went back to work for General Motors as a floor manager in a GM plant. Uh, he decided not to do that. I think an economic recession in the 70s at GM caused him to rethink his own career, and he decided to go back to the field that he loved, which was ceramics. Um, 
Bill moved back to Cambridge Springs, his wife was a jeweler, and they bought an old warehouse, nice rural area, no, uh, no economy at all, and so cheap buildings. Um, Bill sort of over time uh, became, well, along with being the mayor of the city, the city's largest employer in the small town in Cambridge Springs. He now has 40 people working for him in the pottery studio, and, uh, and they produce a line of work that is um, uh, functional utilitarian stoneware, and then uh, some more niche marketed individual porcelain pieces that he uh, collaborates with studios in other part of parts of the country to produce. Uh, a line of work called Flambeau, which is uh, uh, crystal glazed pieces that I believe Bill is producing the works in his studio and another studio is glazing. Bill gave me a list of the never-ending list of skills one needs to do business as a potter uh, and provided this as sort of a guide to what you might want to think about in terms of the business aspects of the field. Uh, if anybody wants that list, I can get it to them. It's a scary one. But, um, but it's really the sort of things that he's gotten involved in over time. He now operates, um, he had bought about a 10,000 square foot building in uh, uh, in Cambridge Springs, that one burned down, and he bought a 38,000 square foot building, which um, now houses the studio and he rents out part of the space to other people. Bennett Bean is another person who's sort of grown over a 30 year period and shows the advantage. I thought the, the similarities in lifestyle choices were, were funny to buy barns and fix them up, but, uh, but Bennett. Uh, it was from the West Coast, moved to the East Coast, um, works in New Jersey now, bought an old barn about 30 years ago with some land, and the, the picture at the bottom is the studio today, that's the old building, um, and his, uh, the inside of the studio itself. Bennett works with one, he's worked with as many as nine assistants, but he really pursues a sort of one-of-a-kind approach to making objects that have morphed over time between a variety of materials and production techniques and crafts. From ceramics, he's moved into, um, uh, well, really ceramic knives, um, into textiles, into paintings. The textiles are now produced in collaboration with another artist, and they're designed by, ben, uh, by Bennett and the other person, and then manufactured in China. So Bennett sort of espoused an early do-it-yourself philosophy of making things either for his own studio, building his own environment, and then also making his own pieces or moving them out eventually to where he was able to have other people help with that process as well. So the last things I'd like to talk about are um, some things around research, self-help, and advocacy blogs because they reflect what people who are working in the field think about today while they're working on it. Um, all of these resources, by the way, are, they posted them on the website for the conference, so don't bother trying to write down an HL URL or anything, because they're all on the website. Uh, Dennis Stevens, I'll start with Dennis, is a person who, um, I know, went to Clemson University, uh, was a ceramic student, went on into media studies in, um, in um, uh, education and is now at Columbia University. Dennis has written, has a blog site called Redefining Crafts. Um, he posts articles, he writes for American uh, Craft Magazine and other sources. A very interesting, very thoughtful website that deals primarily with the critical positioning of crafts from the point of view of somebody working within the field but also from a sort of overview of how one might look at objects themselves. Um, I listed Chandra uh, Debus's uh, website. She is a graduate student at the University of Florida because I found her website fascinating in that it's a sort of list of what graduate students think about. You see Glenn Adamson there, you'll see some other things. So, um, so you'll find uh, this is the sort of thought process. You know, it's a resource not only for other people, but it also it's sort of a diary of her own thought as a graduate student in play today. Another one of great use is the other practical side of this communication network, and that's the clay art discussion site. 
Playard is a network, uh, it's run now by Vicki uh, Harden in, um, in uh, I think San Marcos, Texas, but it's really a do-it-yourself website where people write in about the subject of crafts from uh, particular, in this case, in ceramics, from all over the world. I used its earlier precursor, ClayNet, which was a uh, listserv online years ago when I moved to California and needed to replace my favorite glaze with a non-toxic one, because uh, you couldn't use those things in California. So um, I went on ClayNet and asked people if they had a formula that would do something similar to the glaze that I was using. I got back about 10 formula and then started playing around with them for the next three years and found the ones that I use now. Great source for everything from selling to, um, to knowing how to do something. The last groups are things that sustain and challenge the crafts, and I mentioned some of these because there are unique features, in my knowledge, of how things might be done. Uh, the North Carolina region is replete with people who work in the craft fields and also people who think deeply about it and for them. Um, the Center for Crafts, Creativity, and Design in Hendersonville is sponsored uh, by the Wingate Foundation and also the Kellogg. Uh, it's at the Kellogg Center at the University of North Carolina uh, system building there, or owned by the system. It's about a 10 or 15 acre site that operates um, a symposia, workshops, has a gallery, and more and more has been underwriting both the study and critical <laughs> They've been instrumental in the publication of books. Um, they underwrite craft residencies and scholarships for graduate students, um, like in Glenn's work and others. It's critical to have a critical dialogue about the field in order to uh, not only elevate its stature, but also understand it more thoroughly. Center for Craft Creativity and Design uh, is related in some ways to the Regional Technology Strategies Company which is related to a variety of other groups. But Regional Technology Strategies provides economic development um, planning for areas, and it's not just in the crafts. One example of it is in the craft, but they also have work that they've been doing in the automotive industry, the um, digital technology industry, and other fields. So really, they're more of an economic development engine rather than specifically a crafts development. Um, RTS has support, as you can see, from the Ford Foundation and others, and has created a network of community colleges called CraftNet. Uh, charter colleges, as you'll see the members, were mostly community colleges, um, a number in the southeast part of the United States, but also one in Wales, uh, one in England, one, a couple in South Africa. Currently it has 17 members, um, and CraftNet is now working in conjunction with RTS, uh, Mount Auburn Associates, and then Handmade in America, um, which have formulated alliances and so forth for this. Um, Craft, uh, CraftNet has an online um, curriculum that it's produced for how to do the business marketing of crafts. It has, um, because it's community colleges, they tend to be, uh, by their nature, more vocationally focused than some of the research universities and colleges and universities are. So um, it tends to tie more directly to move, to, for people moving directly from learning a field to then practicing it. Um, so CraftNet is another online resource for this sort of information and another approach to the field. And that's what I've got. Uh, I wanted to show you through these and talk about the different ways in which people learn the crafts, practice them, and then move forward in them. I think it's critical as we look at it, um, you'll hear more later in the symposium about professional societies. You'll hear from, um, I think Arlene Fish will be talking about the American Craft Council and other groups, and I don't want to underplay their importance because they're absolutely central to the development of this thought process. But I wanted to concentrate on this one, on the educational systems. Um, I also want to say in this presentation that uh, sort of as a dis disclaimer, I'm a dyed-in-the-wool modernist, you know, and uh, really 
I, I'm a firm believer in both the social benefit um, and possibility of progress in the world. And so I think that through education and through discussion, it is capable of sustaining. There's a lot of concern today about where the crafts are they going to live. I think they will. I think they'll do just fine. Um, and I think they'll be fine in relation to arts and other cultures as they change, because in that form of education, we're always cherishing and maintaining the past, but we're always moving toward a different future. And uh, that's what we have to do. So thank you. important in a continuum of learning that that, you know, that, that happens. 